The question is, is your mind or your phone a tool that enhances your life or is it your master? And all you gotta do is go stand in the mirror and look at yourself, get naked, look at your finances, look at your relationships and ask, am I living evidence that my mind and my phone are creating health and freedom and building my dreams or am I a victim to rich people's strategies to extract the life right out of me, keep me scared, keep me programmable and keep me a statistic. everybody welcome back to my YouTube channel this is Paul check and today my topic of discussion is minds and phones who is your master these are very very important questions today if you have not been paying attention it's definitely time to wake up to the power of your mind and the power of the extended mind you call a phone that has been used to do magic on you. A lot of it, most of it black, unfortunately. Let's have a look. There's an ancient saying, which I've modified for our purposes, and it says, minds, and I've added phones, make better tools than masters. Once your mind or your phone starts controlling your life, put it simply, you're in deep shit. For a number of reasons. So what I want to do to keep this manageable and digestible is just look at a few concepts so that we can learn how to use our mind effectively. Daniel Siegel, MD, a great psychiatrist, someone whose works I've studied a lot of, gives a beautiful definition of the mind, for which there are very few, by the way. Mind, an embodied and relational process that regulates the flow of energy and information. Let's do that again. Mind, an embodied and relational process. It's always happening that regulates the flow of energy and information. And guess what? The entire universe, including you, can be boiled down to two things, energy and information. So how you use energy and how you inf use information determines the experiences or the circumstances of your life. That is both an individual and a collective truth. So, what we want to do is realize that the mind can get very busy. Deepak Chopra stated in a podcast that I was listening to, he cited research that showed that the average human thinks 68,000 thoughts a day. That's a lot of activity. And of those 90% were found to be negatively oriented. Well, I don't think you need to be a genius to know that if the flow of energy and information coming through your mind or your head at a rate of 68,000 thoughts a day is 90% negative, then you're going to use energy and information to manifest what you don't want. An ancient metaphysical saying says you bring forth that which you gaze upon. So whatever you look at with intention or energize becomes your reality. And if you study quantum physics and the observer effect, lo and behold, whether you see a particle or a wave depends on what you're looking for. And it goes much deeper than that, which I will get into in my upcoming new book around the end of the year. So when we have all that traffic in our mind, it's basically a level of saturation. Uh, some researchers say that we are now processing 
more information in one 24-hour day than people did in their entire lifetimes only 100 years ago due to the accelerating pace of information transfer, largely, of course, due to computer technology. The speed and processing power of computers doubles about every 18 months, and it's been doing so for quite a while. The problem is, is that our nervous system can only handle so much information at a conscious level before it starts to disable us and, and make us anxious and nervous. And if you haven't watched the Netflix, or yeah, Social Dilemma, the documentary Social Dilemma on Netflix, it's a must-see, absolute must-see, so that you understand the dangers of the technologies that are being used against you in phones to addict you and to control you and to get you to do things that you normally wouldn't do if you were using your rational mind and to program you to believe things that are not true. <laughs> Use your imagination as to what I'm talking about. Okay, so in order for us to have a healthy mind, what the sages and saints and wise people have been telling us for thousands of years, for as long as people have been scratching in stones and anything else, is that we need to have time, usually on a daily basis, to empty and quiet our mind, which is kind of like rebooting a computer or defragging a computer so that it runs as an integrated system. Now, there's a million things I could say about the mind, what it is, how it interfaces with your body, spiritual aspects of it, but I'll, I'll try to keep it simple. So we need to give ourselves time every day. We classically call this meditation, and it is part of mindfulness, because if you don't detach from your thoughts, then you fall into the trap of believing them and feeling as though that your reality is the reality of your mind. But how often have you been sure someone stole something from you or took something or moved something or did something or that somebody was cheating on you only to find out later that you were wrong and then you look back on the days, months, weeks or years of all the stress you created and all the resent you created towards someone else only to find out that it wasn't even true yet you were torturing yourself and probably damaging relationships because you could not differentiate a thought or a belief from truth and didn't wait to have the evidence before you made a decision that affected your emotions. And when we do that kind of thing, we get angry towards ourselves or angry towards others and being angry and negative towards others without having hard evidence is essentially expecting the other, it's like drinking poison and hoping the other person dies because you have to produce the emotion in yourself before you can project it to somebody else. Or how do you know how jealous to be or how angry to be or how frustrated to be to demonstrate to them what's really going on in you? So you have to do it to yourself first and unfortunately, with 90% of those 68,000 thoughts being negative every day, we're doing a lot of negative stuff to ourselves every day, 99% of the time without any evidence to back it. Most of the stuff you see on television is bullshit. Most of the stuff coming across your phone screen is crap. Marketing is really the uh, advanced technology of making you believe something that's true that isn't true so you'll spend money on something that you wouldn't spend on or vote for somebody or get yourself poked with something or have a date with somebody that you normally wouldn't have a date with dot 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 so taking time to just empty yourself is a very very important thing to do it can be the first 20 minutes of your day just laying in bed and just being with yourself and just simply following your breathing so that you have something to lock onto that doesn't generate more thoughts or judgments. Just uh, mm, 
this feels good to breathe, or you can use a Buddhist technique called a pure thought, which, for example, as I inhale, I visualize the sun rising up my spine, yang energy rises, inhalation is excitation yang, and I see it at the top of the breath, the sun is sitting right on the crown of my head, and then as I breathe out, the moon settles in my being and I visualize that as the moon settling, it's getting more and more full until right at the bottom of the breath where the energy is between your uh, rectum and your sex organs, um, which is, this is the microcosmic orbit, then you have the breath out and the moon is full. So with each breath, you see the sun rising the sun rises in my being, the moon settles in my being. So by using a pure thought that doesn't have any judgment attached to it or any need to do, should do, I'm able to bring my mind into a focus and after a while the ego convinces itself that it has this technique mastered and it goes to sleep. So you stay conscious while you're also in an unconscious state which is sometimes called a hypnagogic state and that's where deep meditation and intuition and deep insights are often brought to us from the wholeness of ourselves. So as you're sitting in silence, most people will find that their mind is like, a, you know, like a Mexican party where everyone's trying to kill the piñata and there's lots of alcohol and colors and the mind is just all over the place. So we use a technique called witnessing. We don't want to get caught in it. We just want to witness it. Like if you're sitting at a coffee shop, just witnessing people passing by, you don't know any of them, but you just observe, but you stay detached. In alchemy, they have a process called sublimation linked to the air element. Sublimation means to rise above. I call this going into your lifeguard tower. So when I go into meditative silence, I imagine myself climbing up to a lifeguard tower. And the lifeguard's job is to watch everybody on the beach so that the lifeguard can be aware of any potential dangers before it's too late to intervene. But if there's two hot girls swapping spit right there and the lifeguard gets a little excited and staring down there at his fantasy, the 13-year-old getting pulled away in the riptide is about to die, but he got distracted by his little fantasy. That's not witnessing, that's being caught in a thought. And that is what gets anybody in trouble, particularly when that thought is not productive relative to their stated mission, vision, goals, value, or function in their workplace or whatever they're doing. So the act of sublimation means to rise above. Sometimes when we have a true challenge in our life, we can draw a symbol of it or write it on a piece of paper and put it on the floor and just stand above it and look at it. And being above it gives us this bird's eye view of it and we can actually see and perceive things that we can't see, but the act of sublimation here is to rise above so you witness, so the traffic in your mind can be very busy, and it can feel like, oh my God, I gotta do this, I gotta do that. And those real honest, I gotta do this and I gotta do that, so they're not gonna go away, so you don't have to worry, they'll be waiting for you 20 minutes later, but it's all the other stuff, he said, she said, who's screwing who, who's ripping off who, blah, 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 all the stuff that just burns up a lot of your energy and resources but does nothing for the quality of your life, that's what we want to rise above. That's the metaphor for all the stuff on the beach that we're just watching but not you know, staring at and getting trapped in. So when you see all this and you're detached from it, then what you do is you might have a repeated thought like nobody loves me or my boss hates me or um, you know any number of thoughts uh, that 
are demeaning or are demeaning towards somebody else or are scary or threatening to you. So when you have that kind of thought come up repeatedly and it's really stopping you from getting into that meditative relaxation of witnessing, then you have to say, okay, what is the thought? Nobody loves me. Then you ask yourself, what's my dream? What is my dream for myself in my life? Well, nobody loves me. My dream is I feel loved every day. Okay, good. Then you ask yourself, is it really true that nobody loves me? This is classic Byron Katie right here. And you might say yes, but then you can say, well, my dream is to feel loved all the time, so maybe I can choose to love myself. Ah, oh, that's what it is. I can love me. I can be my own best friend. I can be my teacher. I can actually enjoy myself and embrace myself and love myself. And then you can say, is it true? Can you really love yourself? Well, yes, I can. And if you say no, then you can say, well, do I have the potential to love myself? Well, we all have the potential to love ourselves. And if you say, well, I just don't know how to do it, then you say, ah, part of my dream is to find a teacher that can show me how to love myself. And now that you've got that fearful thought handled, it's likely not to keep jumping up and disturbing your ability to stay in witness mode. So we always have to ask, is it true? And is the thought dream affirmative? I can love myself, yes, but what if it's something else like, um, I hate my boss because he hasn't promoted me for two years. He's an asshole. And I hope he gets run over by a car or something like that. Well, it's not a healthy thought, but that's, that's a mild one for the kinds of things I see going on in people. So then you have to say, is it really true? Hmm. Well, I think it's true. Did you ask your boss, do you hate me, boss? Because I'm upset that you haven't promoted me for two years. So could you please tell me why it is that I haven't been promoted and do you hate me? If you're not brave enough to ask the question, then you're a fool for repeatedly thinking the thought and the state that you're in will reflect your lack of ability to use your mind as a tool and it means it has become your master. And minds are very easy to program. That's why phones are so dangerous and screens are so dangerous. I won't go into the depth of that, but I've talked about it extensively. So if you say, okay, the boss says, no, absolutely I don't hate you. The fact of the matter is that the reason you didn't get promoted is because the people that did promote, get promoted were much more qualified for you. They'd taken X, Y, and Z school, and we've given you three opportunities to take those schools, all of which you refused. So that's the real truth. But if you would like to enroll in these schools and get your management skills to where they need to be, I would consider you for promotion. Oh my God, all this time for two years, I've been thinking my boss was an asshole running around, burning my stomach up with all this anxiety and anger and gossiping about it and winding people up, being a pain in the ass all because of something that wasn't even true and I was too chicken to ask for the truth. Then you say, okay, it's true. My boss doesn't think I'm such and such, and that I can get promoted, but I need to go take this school. And then you find out, okay, to take the school, you're going to have to go to night class for three months. And now you've got to say, oh, wow. Well, you know, my wife really wants me home by such and such a time to be with the kids. Six o'clock, let's say. School goes from six to eight. The kids will be in bed. So then you have to say, before you say yes to your boss, I will take those schools so I can get promoted, you have to go back and ask yourself, is that going to be the best for everybody on my dream team, which is everybody that supports you in achieving whatever you state your dream to be for your life? Then you gotta go say, honey, my boss says I can get a promotion if I go to these three schools, but it's gonna take me about six months in night school to accomplish these objectives. Are you okay with that? And she might say, well, honey, how much more money are you gonna make? Well, if you say I'm going to make an extra 500 bucks a month, she said I'd rather have the time with you 
and the kids, then the 500 bucks a month, it's not enough money for the stress it's going to cause the kids and the family. But if he says it's 15,000 bucks a year and that could really enhance your life, then you have a conversation together. And if she says yes, then the dream team's all for it. And they say, okay, how can we support you? And you say, I'll tell you what, how about since I'm going to be late at night while I'm driving or right when I get to school or I'll call you on the phone and say hello or I'll do a FaceTime meeting or whatever it is, but find a way for a healthy compromise to try to keep everybody on the dream team happy. And then all of a sudden you're living your dream. And when you practice this, you'll find out most of the garbage floating around in your head is just garbage. And it's been controlling your life. And people that make a lot of money off you keep that kind of shit going into your mind because stressed people are profitable people. Scared people are easy to brainwash and control. Scared people are easy to brainwash and control and make lots of money off of. Look around, boys and girls, at what's going on, largely due to your phone in your mind. Okay, so next we have to say phone. Is this thing helping me or is it hindering me? Because this is an extension of the mind. This is a global mind technology which means your 68,000 thoughts a day now went to be everybody's thoughts that you look at or interact with on Facebook or Instagram. And some people have so damn much of this going on, it's a miracle that anything's getting done in the world at all. And I can tell you, it mind boggles me that I can put something on the internet any time of the day and get huge responses during work hours and I'm always saying to my wife, how are these people making a living? Somebody's supposed to be paying them, but they're sending me questions and they're watching this video at 11 o'clock or whatever. And that's what happens when you destroy a nation because you lose your work ethic, you lose your focus, and you lose your sense of what's important and you're expecting people to pay you to be productive when you're being unproductive and filling your head. Well, if you're watching me, it's good stuff, but you could be filling your head full of crap, which is really, really common. Most people are spending their time finding out how to pop pimples or who's screwing who or who does what or who eats this or, you know, some of the shit people watch on phones and screens is just mind-boggling to me. It's just beyond me. Maybe I'm getting old. I don't know. Okay, so again, mind equals phone equals mind. It's an extension of your mind. It's got your information on it. Most people don't want to lose their phone because as soon as they put stuff on a phone, they think, oh, I don't have to remember it anymore. My phone's loaded with phone numbers that I don't remember. So Admittedly, this is an extension of my mind. I just use it as a tool. I don't let it control me. Okay? So, with your phone, again, what is your dream? If you don't have a clear sense of your dream, goal, or objective on any given day, then if you don't know where you're going, any road will get you there. That's just a simple fact. Okay? But if someone's paying you to be lost, that's not good for business nor for your future. So what is my dream? Because then I say, am I using my phone or my computer to get supportive information that helps me live my dream and keep my dream team happy because I'm a contributing member to the dream team? If the info that you get is, oh, you've got this or that illness and you've got to do this or that or you're going to be sick or whatever, then you have to ask yourself, is it really true? Don't matter what you see on that screen. Today, with the advanced digital technology, you can make anything look as real as it ever did. In a few minutes, with the software, you can make Paul Check show up all over the world at the same time. You can make Bill Gates show up all over the world at the same time, and he is. But you have to ask yourself, is it true? If you don't ask that, then you're gullible and your life is likely to be far less healthy 
and far less productive and far less meaningful than if you orient yourself toward what your dream goal or objective is and look for supportive info and ask, is it really true? And if you cannot answer that objectively, yes. If someone says to you, is gravity really true? Well, then you can just take a rock, throw it in the air and say, it's pretty damn true. Okay, I think we can all agree upon that one. We don't need to do a bunch of research on the internet to find out if gravity's real. Okay, good. But if somebody's saying, eat this food or take this drug or take this pill or get this whatever, and you don't know if it's really true, then you need to go to the next procedure. You have to look at the fact that we mind is composed of comp complementary opposition. Day creates the night, the night creates the day. North creates south, west creates east, up creates down. That's complementary opposition. Heat and cold are related to each other. You can't have one without the other. It would make no sense. So when we look at complementary opposition, you say, what is my bias? Or what is some expert telling me about such and such of illness or such and such a product or such and such of a technique for weightlifting? And then you have to say, what are the opposing viewpoints by people of equal qualification on the diametrically opposed side, there's your complementary opposition. And then you have to say, okay, I've got these two experts, one saying I'm gonna get sick and die, the other one saying I'm not. Then you have to say, well, what is the evidence that is living evidence? Look at the health, look at the life, look at the individual to see if it's actually true. Are they authentically doing and living the way they're telling you or not? If they are and it's producing results that are tangible and congruent with your dream, then go ahead and do it. If they're not, be very, very suspicious, but there's nothing more tangible than the living, breathing evidence of whatever it is that you're being told is a truth on a phone or a computer screen. Then you have to remember that no matter what you're gaining from phones or minds, in order for it to be dream affirmative and support your goals, needs, or objectives on a day-to-day -day basis, you have to ask yourself, do, do I have the time, the energy, the willingness, the finances, and the resources to effectively implement that into my life? And if you don't, then you have to find a backup strategy or a way to implement that in stages or the greatest idea and the greatest truth can disable you. Okay, so at the end of the day then, the question is, is your mind or your phone a tool that enhances your life or is it your master and all you got to do is go stand in the mirror and look at yourself, get naked, look at your finances, look at your relationships, and ask, am I living evidence that my mind and my phone are creating health and freedom and building my dreams? Or am I a victim to rich people's strategies to extract the life right out of me, keep me scared, keep me programmable, and keep me a statistic. That's my message for you. Meet my tool. Meet my tool. And here I am, just a couple months now shy of 60, as living evidence of what I teach. Aho, great spirit.